Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. This is Mike Steckline, partner with the Institute for Enterprise Excellence. Um, today's topic is something that I've been digging into the last couple of years and have talked to a number of other people in um, organizations that we work with that um, are also learning about this. And uh, I see some connections with the work that we do and wanted to provide this uh, webinar today. Uh, so let's uh, get right into it. The topic is around the Kinevin sense-making framework. Uh, housekeeping details here. Uh, right now I've got the phones muted, uh, but I will be unmuting them a little bit later for some dialogue and Q&A. You can always use the chat function if you would like to um, pose a question or any comments. Uh, this webinar is being recorded so that you can benefit from the recording as well as share it with others uh, a little bit later. Now relative to some background here, uh, most of you are probably familiar with this part of our model. We call it the sustainability model as we're uh, thinking about how to help organizations connect um, purpose, process, and people, and uh, using the different elements of the model that uh, perhaps you're familiar with. Uh, a couple things that I'm thinking about here related to this topic today. Uh, one is around uh, guiding principles, specifically the guiding principle of thinking systemically, and uh, also to think about the systems that we use, the ones that we intentionally design, or perhaps the ones that uh, just show up with our uh, repeated activities. and um, with this aspect related to the Kinevin model, how is it that uh, we understand what type of system that we're dealing with? And I think this is related to some uh, jargon around systems and what do we mean by systems. So it's really around these parts of our model that I'm going to be uh, uh, positing some thoughts here and sharing with you some information and then uh, would benefit from your input and feedback on how this is making sense to you in your work. Uh, so a question that I've asked and uh, we've talked with people about is uh, illustrated on this slide. Um, I posed it this way today. Why is the tool trap so appealing and so common? So what do we mean by the tool trap? Well, these elements of the sustainability model shown on the left-hand side describe the typical approach that most, if not all, organizations pursue as they're trying to uh, develop a culture of continuous improvement where they're trying to achieve some results. They learn about tools. They benefit from those tools. Uh, they attempt to um, spread this uh, into other systems. Uh, and this tends to result in what some people call the flavor of the month um, phenomenon. We call it the comfort of the comfort zone. Uh, contrasted with the um, uh, illustration on the right, which is taking a different pathway, first of all, connecting to purpose, and then understanding some guiding principles, and then taking that pathway that way to design and adjust specific systems. Now, we've used some different phrases to try to encourage people to think about this. Um, one of the latest is to think outside the toolbox, uh, play on terms with uh, thinking outside the box, um, another one that's a little bit more uh, direct and perhaps in your face is where tools lead, fools follow, uh, which comes from a quote from an organization that achieved uh, recognition through the uh, Shingo um, Prize, and that was their advice to other organizations. And then a recent conversation with um, an organization where they merely said, uh, don't be a tool. Uh, but I think these exhortations and, and this desire to get people to think differently by itself probably won't do it. So just want to talk a little bit more about this phenomenon of the uh, comfort of the comfort zone uh, as we describe it. So if you have some desired results you're trying to achieve, this is a healthcare example, people want to see better results in their patient satisfaction scores. So they're unhappy with what they see. Um, they learn about some tools, either developed internally or are borrowed from other folks. Uh, these are just some examples of the kinds of tools that they may use to try to address this problem with um, these results, patient satisfaction, trying to make those uh, results better. And uh, they see good uh, efforts from that. They, they see the numbers move in a direction that they want, and they say it worked great, let's say, in the laboratory. Uh, let's have everyone do this. Let's have everyone use these tools. 
could be huddles, could be PDSA forms, uh, could be uh, different uh, types of tools uh, that people are using. And what we've noticed, and perhaps you folks have noticed this too, uh, where um, oops, the, um, there's pushback. It's a temporary phenomenon that um, people are not so excited uh, just to latch on to those tools that perhaps someone else uh, used and are told that it's going to work for them. And I think it's logical that people will um, push back. Those methods and tools weren't designed by them. They perhaps don't see the value. Lots of different reasons. Um, later on in this um, brief presentation, I'm going to be talking about one of the potential reasons why I think this happens. But anyway, it's a familiar phenomenon for people. And uh, we illustrate this, as I said before, in what we call the comfort of the comfort zone, which is seen as this series of waves of different programs um, that people latch on to and find promise in. Um, and you can see some of these illustrated here. I've added some in the lower left-hand corner that we've heard about, and perhaps you've heard about too, as um, people have been um, exploring different ways to try to um, create a culture of continuous improvement. And uh, this is a quote from uh, the author of the model that I'm going to be talking about today from Dave Snowden. And he says, uh, it seems to be in the pursuit of the one new wonderful thing that we should all follow. And I thought that was a great quote and I uh, wanted to sh share that with you as we get into a little bit more about this uh, Kinevin model. Now, we fall into this trap, too, so no one's immune to this. And uh, here's an example. We've um, put together an approach, a method. Um, to help people to make the connection uh, between uh, the principles that they're learning about, the kinds of systems they would like to have, and then experimenting with the kinds of tools that might help that system to drive both the ideal behaviors and the desired results. Some of you may be familiar with this, have used it. Um, we wrote about this in a white paper that you can see at the bit.ly link at the top. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, so our attempt was to try to um, have people work this route, to try to think about, first of all, connect to purpose, think about these principles that we're learning about, and then think about this method as something that could be a bridge over here on this side to help people to think about um, what do we need to do to get both the results we want to achieve, but also get those results through ideal behaviors, and then pull or um, invent or design the kind of tools that we need um, in order to make that to, to be a sustainable method. Uh, and I just uh, contrast that with on the left-hand side that some people, again, see the um, bowling out of tools as um, this is a coin term from, heard this from Mark Graben, where he talked about uh, the first three, four letters in the word linoleum, lean and name only. It's another description of the phenomenon of the program of the month approach. And unfortunately, as we've been uh, introducing this, uh, it works well with many organizations that uh, try to understand that uh, we're trying to encourage experimentation about um, these principles and uh, designing the kind of systems that are going to drive this. Uh, there are some organizations where they place it over here on this side, and this approach uh, merely becomes another tool. And uh, I think it's just a phenomenon of a common um, pattern, or call it a pathway that um, many people are familiar with. Uh, whether it's uh, familiarity with programs, uh, completing an assignment, such as in school, um, people completed an assignment, uh, they checked it off, they were done, uh, or they um, had the improvement team do it to people or for people. And uh, we've seen, um, examples where people come up with really uh, great um, documents and um, they um, are very proud of them and as they should be but unfortunately it doesn't result into um, something that uh, leads to any sort of uh, permanence about what they're doing uh, the tendency is to not see it as um, embracing a new philosophy to see it as a continuous never-ending um, effort to see that they're never really done uh, the systems that they design um, are a first attempt to try to come up with a system that might work, but always see it as something that could be um, experimented with and improved. And um, so um, 
we are always encouraging people to, as they learn about the method, we think the method still has validity, um, but encourage them to do it with people to help them um, to see it as a way to experiment. And so, again, I just offer this as a way that uh, we too have fallen into this trap. And so uh, one of the things I've been thinking about here is what are some of the possible reasons why this occurs? And um, in a previous white paper that perhaps you've read, and you can see the bit.ly link here, the um, reason that uh, we posed in that paper is it's possible that one of the reasons is, is people don't understand the different kinds of knowledge that is needed to solve different kinds of problems. And uh, perhaps down the road, uh, we'll have a webinar on this particular um, topic. But if you want to learn more about that particular idea, you can consult the uh, white paper that we've written there. Um, but um, for the purpose of this webinar today, one of the possible reasons is, as many people don't understand, that there really are different kinds of systems that they're dealing with. And that's what I wanted to explore today and uh, to think a little bit about this. Now, one way to think about this, and I'm going to refer back to um, the work of Dr. W. Edwards Deming, that before he died in 1993, he had articulated the um, knowledge from which his uh, 14 principles or 14 points came about. And so I'm just going to show um, by way of illustration with these four interactive um, circles of knowledge here um, what I'm talking about as far as some of these possible reasons for uh, the tool trap. So uh, reason number one, I already mentioned, it could be a not, a not really fully understanding this body of knowledge. Um, Dr. Deming called it theory of knowledge. Um, so we not, don't understand different types of knowledge is needed to solve different types of problems. Um, understanding variation, last month's webinar uh, provided by Mark Graben. Uh, he and I have been working together on a lot of different presentations about when people don't really understand variation. Um, so that is another area of possibility. And again, back to the topic of today, um, it could be that people don't really understand um, the different kinds of systems that they're dealing with. Um, so um, one of the things that I almost always get, either verbally or through some sort of um, uh, feedback from people, um, body language, is, oh man, this is too theoretical. Um, we don't want to talk about theory. We want to talk about the practical uh, implications of things. We don't have time for uh, making things too theoretical. Uh, and I just want to put this in context of a way to think about this. So um, the results that we see, um, the artifacts we use, the tools we use, those are all things that are on like the surface. And think about a metaphor of an iceberg. Those are the things we see on the surface. What's under the surface immediately is, is those come from different processes that we have either intentionally designed or just the habits and the ways that we do things. Those processes are parts of systems or structures um, that we have. And those systems and structures are built, again, either intentionally or just by the way people think and principles that they have in their heads about the way thing, the way the world works. And if you went way to the bottom of the uh, iceberg, that's the bodies of knowledge that are behind the principles. And I've just illustrated those four circles there as um, the way Dr. Deming was encouraged people to think about the knowledge that is behind the principles and then thinking about the principles and his terminology, the 14 points, and then moving up the scale uh, or the model to think about uh, what are the practical implications. So I'm gonna get to this, what are the practical uh, implications so that people can see this as uh, beyond just a theoretical exercise as perhaps something nice to learn, but maybe doesn't make any sense to them in their day-to-day -day world. So we could think of ourselves as pracademics of trying to uh, maintain a space on the waterline uh, between the, the theory about what works, what doesn't, based on good principles, um, but also uh, the practical reality uh, that people are dealing with, including ourselves. And so we try to illustrate the practical benefits for managers, executives in all categories of industry, uh, whether it's um, healthcare, business, government, uh, education, about uh, when we don't understand this, um, there are consequences, some of which show up as fear, frustration, alienation, waste, and things that show up as real financial costs. So there's a real financial cost 
um, to not fully understanding uh, these things. And uh, so just returning back to this question, I want to dig into this a little bit um, and talk a little bit about uh, one of the possible reasons why we may be falling into the tool trap is, is uh, we may not understand the different types of systems that there are and the systems that we're dealing with. So I want to get into it and just explain a little bit about what I've been learning uh, about the Kinevin framework. And uh, when we unmute the phones later, I'll be interested to hear from others uh, that perhaps have been learning and exploring about this. So that for those who aren't familiar with it, uh, just a little bit of background. Um, Professor Dave Snowden uh, has been working on this concept for more than 20 years, I think. Um, and um, you'll see his name associated with the Kinevin uh, model uh, and where it came from. So he's uh, from Wales. And uh, th there's a map, if you're not familiar with it, where Wales fits within the United Kingdom. There's the Welsh flag uh, and the Kinevan framework. The word Kinevan um, is um, pronounced as I have illustrated there. Uh, it has a meaning in Welsh. It doesn't have an English term, but uh, roughly translated, it means the um, place of our multiple belongings. Uh, and so um, this became something that, um, as uh, Dr. Snowden was working on this over the years with others, uh, resulted in a really interesting uh, Harvard Business Review article that you can uh, pick up and uh, read. Uh, the November 2007 um, article is one of the most uh, cited um, HBR articles that there is. And, um, he co-authored it with uh, another author, and they um, talked about uh, the Kinevin model in that uh, paper. So that's been more than 10 years ago. So this has uh, been around. Uh, you can learn a lot about this through the uh, Cognitive Edge website and a really handy short video um, that you can link to. You can go to that bit.ly link and learn directly there about that. So um, my attempt today is to sort of unpack what I've been learning about this and uh, then relate it back to uh, my theory about one of the reasons why we may be falling into the tool trap. And then going back to what are the practical implications about learning more about this. So let's dig into this. So on this uh, blank slide here, I'm gonna put on the right hand side, uh, a zone of predictability, and I'm going to put on the left-hand side a, a zone of where things are unpredictable. And I'm going to be filling this um, this uh, slide with some um, concepts here related to what I've been learning about the model. Um, and um, on this side, I'm going to think about and be placing um, what uh, is being called ordered systems. So uh, the latest way of diagramming this is shown this way. And as you see the full picture unfold, uh, perhaps it'll make sense to you. Um, but uh, over in this lower right-hand corner, um, we think about on the ordered side and the predictable side of um, obvious systems. Originally, it was called simple systems. And these are systems where everyone can agree about what can and should be done if they're um, dealing with this type of a system. Uh, in this type of a system, there is a relationship between cause and effect, and we can see logically that if we do this, uh, we're going to get that. Um, there are fixed constraints using the terminology of um, theory of constraints here, and uh, examples of this. So um, when there's recipes, checklists, procedures, things we've done multiple times, in the terminology that people are using around lean, they may think about it as standard work. What's the current best way that we do this? Um, the term best practice is used uh, here. And uh, basically it's the agreement about uh, the logic that you see when this particular uh, situation comes up, we already have agreed upon processes by which this is how you handle it. So for instance, uh, you work in a billing office and you see a certain type of thing coming into your desk. Um, you think about it and you go through this um, scenario here, this decision model, it's called sense. And then you categorize it. You think about, have I seen something like this before? You say, yes, this is familiar. And this is how I'm going to respond. And there are some systems that are like this. And um, so um, um, that's an important part of um, understanding systems that we know about. Now I'm going to talk about the upper right-hand corner, 
which uh, is a zone um, of complicated systems. These are systems that require some expertise. Uh, this is where there is a relationship between cause and effect, but it isn't always self-evident. And um, this is where there are some governing restraints involved. And even though you may require experts, uh, those experts may not agree. Um, and this is where some analysis is needed. So it's not just a matter of categorization. We need to go through a process of, of um, I'll just go forward here, sense, then analyze, and then respond. And contrasted between this uh, be best practice, uh, this is good practice. Um, some examples that I'm thinking about here, I think this is what happens in medicine, um, going to, to a clinician to um, get some help medically. Um, their expertise is uh, put to play here. Um, different physicians, clinicians may have different ways of handling things. Same with uh, going to a lawyer, uh, different expertise needed. I think engineering comes into play here. It's a um, system that has many moving parts. Another example is um, sending a man um, to the moon and back, um, call it the moonshot. A lot of complicated things need to be thought about and put together. You needed a lot of expertise, and you bring together that expertise in order to address the problem. So we'll contrast that. It's still on the ordered side, right-hand side of this uh, slide, but it's, um, um, again, it's different from the simple system. Now I want to talk about the upper left-hand corner, and in this left-hand corner, we'll talk about complex systems. Some terminology people are using is uh, complex adaptive systems, and I think that's uh, some, an important area for continued exploration. Anyway, in this particular category, this is where cause and effect is only evident um, when we look back on things. Um, we can't immediately predict right now cause and effect, but when we uh, reflect and think, we can see it in hindsight. Um, this is where you see unpredictable and emergent outcomes. You don't really know what's going to happen. Um, the outcomes emerge, and this is where um, the terminology here is there are some enabling constraints. Um, and contrasted with best practice, for, which is for the obvious, and good practice for the complicated. Um, this results in emergent practice. Um, it emerges from um, the experiments, really, um, which, which means in this terminology, as far as the decision-making model, uh, you probe, you then sense, and then you respond. And um, this is where you see um, what I would think about is safe to fail experiments where you try something and if it's working, you amplify it. If it's not working, you dampen it. And uh, this is where I would see some examples, um, you know, developing strategies and developing um, uh, experiments to test those strategies. I think those fit here. Um, I would put this in many people systems whenever you have people involved, um, complex um, parts uh, interactive that are developing. Um, Dr. Snowden uses a great example of um, hosting a um, nine-year-old birthday party. Now, I'm not going to repeat that story on uh, today's webinar here, but I will in the recording um, insert a section where he's describing that story because I think it does a great job of, um, of illustrating uh, what that looks like. So I'm going to place that in the recording. Um, immediately after this section. One is to think about managing a party for a bunch of children. Can everybody imagine a party for a bunch of nine-year-olds? Anybody managed one recently? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, management may not be the right word, all right, but you know what I mean. Okay, so let's go through the three different types of system. If you assume the party is chaotic, then it means the children's behavior is completely random, which means they'll prob probably discover drugs and alcohol and go on a personal experience of self-discovery. <laughs> Your house may burn down in the process, but all property is theft and it was socially constructed in the first place, so why are you worried about that? I have friends in California who have tried this, but never more than once. The recovery cost is very high. On the other hand, if the system is ordered, this will be more familiar to you. Yeah, the first thing you have to agree is clearly articulated learning objectives for the party. The learning objectives should be aligned with the mission statement for education in the society to which you belong, 
and should be printed off on motivational posters with pictures of eagles soaring over valleys and water dropping into ponds. And they should be placed around the room where you're going to hold the party. You should then produce a project plan for the party. The project plan should have clear milestones yeah, against which you can measure progress against ideal party outcome. And the senior adult should start the party with a motivational videotape. <laughs> you don't want the children wasting time in play which isn't aligned with the learning objectives of the party itself. And then they should use PowerPoint to demonstrate their personal commitment to the party objectives <laughs> and show the children how their allowances are linked to the achievement of the milestone targets. Following the highly successful completion of the party, you conduct the after-action review, update your best practice database on party management, and mandate future process improvements. If for any remote reason at the end of this the children aren't happy, then you hire an appreciative inquiry practitioner who will get them to tell happy clappy stories <laughs> so they have happy mental models and suitably indoctrinated they like whatever you put in front of them next time. Everybody reasonably familiar with this approach to party management? <laughs> the complex systems approach, on the other hand, is much simpler. In fact, we sometimes call complexity the new simplicity. We start off by drawing a line in the sand. This is known as a boundary. We look the children in the eye and we say, cross that, you little bastards, and you die. <laughs> And one of the things you learn fast as an adult is the value of flexible, negotiable boundaries. Because rigid boundaries tend to become brittle and break catastrophically. We then, and I'm deliberately introducing the language now, then we introduce catalytic probes. A football, a videotape, a barbecue, a computer game. In the hope that a pattern of play, which is called an attractor, will form. If it's a beneficial one, we give it energy, we amplify it. If it's a negative one, we dampen it, we try and destroy it. So what we manage is the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors, within boundaries. And that is the fundamental principle of complexity theory applied to organizations or software development. Now, the zone to the lower left-hand corner, um, I'm going to be getting into, but before I get into that, I just want to point out that the a barrier between this zone and the other zones uh, is a little bit different and it's often represented with this little wave or, um, or uh, hook toward the bottom and what that's meant to illustrate is is you can think of this line between this zone which is the simple and this last zone we're talking about which is the chaotic system zone as a cliff and think about that as something um, that is a different sort of a transition point between those there. So in a chaotic system, um, you would uh, think about this as this is where there really are no effective restraints. Um, sometimes it's entered accidentally, and if that's the case, um, the first step is to try to stabilize things first. Sometimes it's entered deliberately, where you're trying to uh, come up with innovative solutions to things. So there's um, there's no good or bad term related to um, chaotic. It's just a descriptor. And again, depending upon how you got into it, um, there's different benefits or consequences to that. Now, when you are dealing with a chaotic system, uh, the decision model is to act and then sense and then respond. Now, a commonly used example of what does it mean to have a chaotic system and then respond to a chaotic system um, it's often cited that uh, think about the attack on 9-11-2001 uh, and uh, the chaos that ensued and then also the immediate responses um, that occurred related to that. So this is where, again, contrasting with the different kind of practice, we see um, novel practice. These are practices that uh, um, perhaps uh, we've had to come up with, uh, never tried before and uh, uh, the responses have never been tried before. Now there is a fifth part of the, um, of the diagram here that is in the center. And this is um, contrasted with ordered systems. This is disordered systems. And the way uh, I've been learning about this is 
this is where we are many of the many times. Um, we're not so sure what system that we're dealing with. So uh, it's a it's a zone of um, thinking about what's possible. What are the different possibilities we're dealing with with the problems or the systems that are at hand? So let's get into some of the practical applications of knowing about this and what does it mean? Uh, the first thing uh, to think about and know about is, is depending upon what space you're in, uh, you need to act differently. And I tried to give examples of acting differently depending upon uh, what um, type of system we're dealing with in each of those um, corners. Um, if that's the case, then there is no one size fits all. There is no one way that we need to go about trying to address the problems that we have. And I think there's some enormous consequences to that we have to think about because our tendency seems to be that um, we'll tend to uh, interpret a situation based upon our own individual preference for action. So for instance, if our tendency is to think about uh, things can be solved if everyone would just follow standard work and it's all a matter of getting agreement about that. Um, that's our pre preferred practice. We're viewing things as if they were simple and obvious systems in the lower right-hand corner. Um, if our preferred practice is, is uh, we just need to bring the right expertise and experts to this and we just haven't given them enough time or enough resources to do it, um, that's uh, thinking about everything as if it was complicated. Um, if we um, prefer to think about things as experiments that need to be pondered and thought about and, and reacted to, um, our tendency might be up in the lower left-hand corner. And uh, if we see everything is chaotic, uh, we're, we may tend to just try anything, um, just try to do whatever happens, and um, that's the world that we, how we view the world all the time. Now I want to build on a little bit and talk about that zone uh, between the obvious and the chaotic in uh, what um, Dr. Snowden talk, calls the complacency zone, because I think this also has some implications here. So if we do tend to see things as being simple and obvious, if we move too many things into this zone, such as everything must be standardized, we must have um, let's say, um, job breakdown instructions for everything, um, we may tend to believe that um, this is the way the world is. And we'll also be lulled into a sense of complacency where we feel just past success is going to be future, future success. And um, that becomes a real problem because you can find yourself falling over the cliff into the chaotic uh, zone. And um, this is going to be hard, very uh, difficult to um, recover from. Um, we see this in organizations that um, haven't really thought about what's the purpose of their organization. Uh, they assume that past success means uh, future success, and they haven't thought about what is the need that exists in the organization, and they haven't put forward um, thoughts or haven't taken the time to really understand uh, the customer's needs. And they find themselves, um, again, falling over the cliff when they realize that um, the business has gone elsewhere. Someone else comes along and does something better, and um, they are trying to recover. Um, but uh, it's going to be very hard to recover because other people have come along and uh, done what they've done a lot better. And there's a whole history of... Of, of industries and companies that have gone out of business because they fell into the complacency zone and they just thought the good times were going to roll. So that's just one example of that. But I think it's an important phenomenon to think about. Now, the latest iteration of the Kinevin model um, is showing um, what um, is being called the liminal uh, zone. And this is the um, illustrated here by the, the green wave. And this has to do with... Um, understanding the transitions um, between the different um, areas, the different types of systems. And this is just something that um, I personally am, am exploring and trying to understand, uh, so don't have a lot to say about this. But as you learn about this more and learn about, so what must we do with this and understanding the transitions that people need to make and try to make between the different um, uh, spaces that they're in, I think that's going to be an important um, point to understand. So uh, watch this space uh, for the future. Now, 
there's another presentation that I saw from uh, Dr. Snowden that was uh, from a webinar uh, that um, you can go to the bit.ly link and lo look at the lower left hand corner. Um, but I thought it was pertinent for today's um, topic around uh, why do we fall into this tool zone? And um, he described it in this two by two matrix, um, which um, shows, and he was trying to illustrate it, how do we avoid the hype and the false promises? So the way I think about this is he, he's got um, uh, two um, matrices, uh, two um, um, axes here. On the vertical, he's got uh, things that are predictable and things that are, are that predict and things that explain. And then on the horizontal, on the left-hand side, where we have a scientific method or an engineering approach, call it science. And on the right-hand side, contrast that with uh, making observations, forming hypotheses, and coming up with a method. So let's unpack this a little bit, and, and I want to talk a little bit about um, the practical implications. So there is an approach to um, trying to improve things where people will study cases. Let's um, study different cases and see um, what someone else did. Um, uh, let's suppose uh, that um, we study business cases or different uh, companies that we go visit and find out, so what did they do? And then we come back and form some sort of a method, and that's in the upper right-hand corner. And we're, we're trying to explain what's going on. We see a correlation of factors, um, and there is some value to this. And so, again, it's not right or wrong, it's, but it is a valuable approach. And um, Dr. Snowden just puts it into this um, matrix here to show where it fits. On the left-hand side, again, I'm staying on the explanation zone here, the left-hand side. This is where he sees uh, the Kinevin uh, framework based on science. Um, and uh, it's more than just um, a series of um, case studies. It is, again, based on science um, to explain um, what is happening and to try to help people to uh, manage that space and to test for coherence. Uh, the lower left-hand corner, um, this is where uh, we would place uh, the classical sciences um, where the hypothesis has been tested. There's been specific claims, um, and um, this is for prediction. Um, it's been demonstrated that um, this is the cause and effect, and this is how this works. Now, before I get into the lower right-hand corner, I just want to show what's shown at the lower bottom of the scale, and it goes back to... Um, spread or scalability. Um, when you try to scale things or spread um, from the left-hand side, uh, there's a low risk. If you try to spread or scale from the right-hand side, uh, including with um, case-based approaches, uh, there is a higher risk, which then gets us into the lower right-hand corner, which in this one is described as pseudoscience, where we see um, people come up with simplistic recipes, um, hyped universal claims, uh, and this is uh, what I really think is, can be quite dangerous if we're not careful about it, and it's labeled here as inappropriate. Now, again, Dr. Snowden does a terrific job of explaining this, and I'm not trying to um, um, replicate what he does. So in the final um, recording of this, I'm going to insert a section here where you can listen to his approach to, uh, ex explanation of this, and uh, he'll do a much better job, but I, w I do want to uh, include that in the uh, final recording of this so people can benefit from the, the fuller explanation. So I'm going to insert it right here at this point. Matrix here. Um, on one matrix, I want to look at the degree to which something has a scientific method behind it. Right. Um, that means science, science isn't just about identifying data, constructing a hypothesis, and assuming the hypothesis is true. It's about testing the hypothesis to see if it works the next time around, something which social scientists have forgotten about, all right? Now, partly because they could never replicate anyway, right? um, The other is what I'm actually, I'm assuming that observation plus hypothesis produces a method. So that's, that's kind of like, in some cases it's valid, I'm not going to challenge it, but it's more restrictive. So what we end up with, and this is one of those two-by-twos where the best thing isn't going to be in the top right-hand box. I just want to, you know, be, there is an expectation. I don't want you to be broken here. Kind of here I have the degree where I can predict or I can explain. So classic science, yeah, classic scientific method, 
has a scientific method behind it and it can make predictive statements. Now, that's actually quite important because the ability to predict is key because it gives us a level of certainty. But that's kind of like only, it doesn't really work in social systems. Uh, if you go back to the foundation of sociology in the 17th, 18th century, the assumption is that we can create a mathematics of human conditions and that project has singularly failed. Yeah? Because actually the nature of the system is very different, which I'll come to in a minute. Right? But basically I've got scientific method. Yeah? Um, we then have this opposite one, which is the most common thing that you see in IT and management systems, which is basically I observe cases, it's the sort of stuff I've been slightly negative about so far. It has value provided you claim explanatory power, not predictive power. Uh, the thing where these go wrong is where people say, therefore I've got the recipe, if you do this it will produce the result. At that point it becomes a form of pseudoscience. Yeah? The reality is, as long as you say it's got explanatory power, that's kind of like okay. Yeah? Um, which actually, that is the pseudoscience. Yeah? You know, I've observed this, I've seen these patterns, I've now created a recipe, I've created a consultancy method. If you follow these five steps or three of these three methods, you will get this result. Right? Now that's pseudoscientific because it's based on observational data without testing of hypotheses. The stuff that I'm working on at Bangor University with colleagues, which is called naturalizing sense-making, um, basically says what natural science does is it provides a constraint. So if we understand what science has proved around systems or about cognitive science or about the way people make decisions, the way systems interoperate, that provides a constraint, a coherence, and therefore, we can actually say within those constraint structures what has the lowest energy cost of replication. Yeah. This has major implications, by the way. If I look at the stuff I'm doing on counterterrorism at the moment, Al-Qaeda has a higher energy cost of replication within the same constraints as ISIS-ISIL, which has a low en very low energy cost of replication, which explains why it propagates a lot faster, but also says why you need a containment strategy before you have a destruction strategy. Because if something has a very low energy cost of replication, attempting to destroy it before you contain it will mean it will mutate and spread faster, uh, which is actually what we're seeing. Yeah. Now, I'm giving that as an illustration because actually if we get the science right, it allows us to make statements before we actually know the outcome, and that's of increasing importance. Yeah. So basically, I'm falling in within that box, yeah, and my job now is to kind of like go through some of the sciences. I should also say that basically the left-hand box can scale the right-hand box doesn't scale very well because it's dependent on the quality of the original observations. There's no stability in it. So it tends to be more transient in terms of the way it works. So any case-based method is really constrained not only by the cases study, by the context in which the cases were created. Yeah? A case study in IT from the 1980s will not work yet in the current decade simply because the context has shift, shifted, let alone the cases themselves. Yeah? And finally, yeah, kind of like that has value. That is actually inappropriate, and that includes natural science within social systems. Yeah? Um, it kind of like ain't going to work, right? and attempts to do it to fail, so we've got to think differently about the problem. So here's some practical implications that I've been thinking about. Um, standard work is not the answer to every problem. Um, if you think through some of the things that I've illustrated here, um, you may realize that that is true. Um, I've seen a lot of people that, uh, and talked to a lot of people that uh, it seems that every time um, we've got some sort of a situation, they've concluded that it's because we either don't have standard work or people are not following standard work, which may be true, but I don't think every system uh, is in that lower right-hand corner of the obvious and simple. Um, same thing here, neither is an A3. Um, not every problem needs to go through a Socratic process of um, probing for uh, different uh, possible solutions, uh, looking at the, thinking about the Kinevin model, the upper left-hand corner of the complex, uh, and A3 isn't always the approach that's needed. Uh, here's a radical statement, neither is lean. Um, I think that um, depending upon how you define lean, um, it may not be um, what is needed in order to address the kind of system uh, that we're dealing with. I think there's an implication of uh, being wary of train the trainer. So when people are learning um, methods and tools, um, trying to understand the theory, 
but not really understanding, fully understanding the why behind the what. Um, we can too quickly put people into situations where they're merely imitating what they saw someone else do, merely imitating the techniques, but they haven't really understood um, the full nuances of what's going on. And I think that can cause problems. Uh, Dr. Deming's advice here was the beginner, beginner is entitled to a master, but there are full, so few masters um, involved. I think that uh, we're going to have to do a lot more study about um, how we address complex ad adaptive systems. I think that's one area that um, there's a lot of exploration, a lot of study. I'm currently uh, enrolled in an online class uh, with the um, Cognitive Edge um, company and um, following along with many people from around the world in a cohort uh, learning more about the Kinevin model and uh, this is a big part of it is learning what what it means to really understand and cope with complex adaptive systems. Uh, uh, another thought here not the final thought but another thought is is it may not be possible to eliminate the tool-based trap but perhaps we can recognize it when we may be falling into it sooner and adjust accordingly. And then finally, um, before I unmute the phones, I'm very interested to learn what others have been, if you've um, had familiarity with the Kinevin model, uh, if you're interested in um, sharing uh, your uh, learnings, that would be great. Uh, also relative to the um, online course that I'm involved in, um, there will be opportunities for me to involve others in some learnings around that. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I'll be reaching out to our community of academic learners and seeing if you'd like to participate along with me as uh, we explore this. So again, my attempt today was to try to think about one of the possible reasons for the tool trap. Uh, to explore this idea that perhaps it's because we don't understand the different types of systems that we're dealing with. And then when I think about this, to think about uh, the left-hand side, are we falling into a trap where there's some simplistic recipes that have been proposed? Um, are, are, we, are people proposing the universal claims? And uh, are we also falling into a trap that could be coming from just case-based interpretations of uh, different um, companies that are, have tried things and we try to take that case and then apply it to ours. So some questions I'm thinking about on the right-hand side is, so what kind of system might I be dealing with? What type of action uh, is needed? And then what is my preferred action um, and how do I need to adjust that in order to match the kind of situation that we're in? And then going back to this illustration, um, this needs to be something that isn't uh, just a um, theoretical exercise. It has to be something that relates to, so what are the practical applications if we're going to really try to minimize um, things such as fear, frustration, alienation, waste, and real financial costs. And so it's, it's my contention that uh, thinking about what type of system we're dealing with and that acting accordingly has immense practical benefits. By way of references, I just want to again point you back to this is a, a good resource here, Cognitive Edge. I mentioned that uh, short video. That's the bit.ly link in the middle. And if you go to YouTube, um, just type in Dave Snowden. Um, there's a number of really terrific um, webinars that are available there uh, that people can avail themselves to. So I'm going to unmute the phones and just see if anyone has any experiments, experience with Kinevin or if uh, the topics that I've talked about uh, cause any um, interest or, or uh, conversation with people. So I'm going to pause and um, get some input from folks. Hi, Mike. Um, I th think that the and I had seen the framework before, but it's one of those that takes a few iterations to for to beat it into my head. Mm -hmm. um, I think you made it clear the um, the connection between um, strategy as an adaptive learning process and adaptive organizational learning process. Um, mm -hmm. if we look at um, most of the problems that we're trying to solve are complex. And so this idea that we've talked about on many of these um, 
webinars that you've hosted is that we would treat strategy um, formulation and execution as rapid cycle lean learning group type of thinking i mean it just it really i think again adds to that um, uh, the, it really brings the pre-academics to why that approach is superior because when i look at the other framework and that's the first time i've seen that other framework the, the four by four mm -hmm. and so i'm gonna have to see about 15 more times for me to um, really get it the way you do but when I think about traditional consulting, it seems like kind of the spread has been and the scale has been from the right hand side at best case based. So everybody should do it or at worst case, the pseudoscience and everybody should do it. Um, and th that's where I think I've seen the traditional consulting model, whereas um, I think the the if I understand that model correctly, we'd be better off if we thought about spread from the left-hand side of that grid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree, Jeff. And I thought a lot about some of the work that you've been doing and writing about when I thought about um, when we have the complex systems and we're trying to um, select better strategies for our company um, or our part of the company, uh, where does that best reside? Um, and also the challenge of of um, making sure at least we're pretty confident that that's the space that we're de really dealing with. So I'm glad to see you found benefit from that. Um, I'm curious, anybody that's on the call today, has anybody had familiarity with and um, use of the Kinevin model? Or is, or is this new to folks? Is this new to everyone on the call? So, Mike, this is CJ. Hey, CJ. Um, and um, I had never seen it before, and I'm just fascinated by it because a lot of times we go in thinking we're going to do an A3, and it's, you know, there's there's some complexity to it, but we don't know the extent of it, mm -hmm. and they take longer, and they take so much longer than we think. And so, a lot of times, you know, it's it's uh, might be complicated, but it really goes into the more complex. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so where we didn't realize it had all of those. So um, I, I guess I'm looking at it as saying, you know, I go in with something that I think is going to help them. And yes, it's a tool that I'm starting with. But this this discussion uh, is making me think, why is it so hard to move uh, something forward? And, and what quadrant are we in at that time? Yeah. I think those are important points, and I'm excited about uh, continuing to learn about this and um, sharing with you and others. And again, I'll repeat the offer that as I move forward with this, I think there's going to be some opportunities for me to reach out to to my connections to um, involve you in involve you in the study that I'm doing on this. So I'm interested in that. That's great. Anyone else have familiarity with or use of the model? I have familiarity with it. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Michelle. Oh, thanks, uh, Michelle Johnson. I, I just wanted to mention that I, I hadn't seen that before. I think it is a useful framework, um, even at its highest level. You know, I, I was already thinking about how my business partners might receive a full explanation of that. And I, I think there's a certain high level uh, version of that that I can use just uh, tapping into that complex uh, versus complicated and that um, the idea of sense, respond, act, or, or, you know, I might be getting that wrong, but I think that that felt like something there and then falling off the cliff when you've, when you've been inclined to keep something, uh, think that it's simpler than it is, then you run that risk. And I, I think uh, that's a good way to think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate those comments. Ted Toussaint had um, introduced me to that when we were talking about innovation um, and what's the nature of the strategic issue that you are think you're trying to solve. And so it's one of three frameworks that he introduced me to that really helped me uh, think through um, when, when we, based on our understanding of the current state um, and the, the strategic issues that are um that we think exist in the current state what is the nature of that strategic issue so that's where it helped me a lot 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. And therefore, how, when is innovation required? You know, when do you not know the answer? When do you, you know, in, in innovation, you don't, you don't know the relationship between cause and effect. So mm -hmm. you're definitely over there on the left hand side. Yeah, and you're also going to perhaps enter into that chaotic zone with intention to um, produce some, um, you know, you know, novel um, practices, things that have never been tried before, and that's an intentional move into that zone versus an accidental move. Yeah. Okay. Mike, can you describe just a little bit more about the, the small zone in the middle, the disordered? Yeah, I'll move back to that slide. Um, and um, so the disordered, um, the way I've been learning about this and thinking about this is um, when, when you don't know what you're dealing with, if you don't know if what I've got here is something um, in either of the, any of the zones, you're really in that disordered zone where you're trying to figure things out. And this is where we may be most of the time. We may not know. Um, if we're not cognizant of this, you know, we may say, oh, I really haven't thought about what's going on here. So it's just a way to think about that you're not always in one of those four. I mean, mentally yourself, you may be just trying to figure out what am I dealing with here? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Any questions? While you were talking, it brought to mind a, a construct we were using frequently about the type of decision and who needs to be making the decision, whether or not it's an individual or a group and it's a consensus versus not. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, as you were you know, describing this again for the first time, I kind of saw a relationship between how you get decisions made might have a lot to do with the nature of the system you're messing with. Yeah, I think that would be something good to um, think about and explore. And again, anytime we draw pictures, we're trying to explain what the heck's going on. This model is a, a picture. It's a sense trying to, uh, it's making sense of things. And I know that's another model people have been using to said, uh, in order to try to make the best possible decision, let's think about um, which um, type of uh, involvement that we need by people and what type of decisions. So I appreciate that input. Well, as I said before, I'm gonna continue studying this and um, you're welcome to join along for the ride. I'll have different ways to involve you with that. Uh, so this won't be the first time that we talked or the last time we talked about this topic. Um, so what happens next, I'll put the recording to this, including the snippets that I mentioned that I want to include um, um, Dave Snowden's uh, direct wording into that, because I think that would be a, a full benefit for the group. But you can go to our website and pull that recording up when you go to previous events. Um, next month, uh, Dan Robertson from um, uh, Pennsylvania, um, he's at uh, Penn Health, uh, has um, agreed to put together a presentation on A3 thinking, uh, biases and heuristics of problem solving. And Dan and I have had an, um, multiple conversations about uh, A3 and problem solving. And, and so I think this is going to be a really great presentation. And so we're putting that together. Some things that um, are in the works, I've got a number of people that have said that they're interested in putting together a webinar. Um, no dates have been mentioned yet. I do know that just in conversation this morning with some folks at uh, the Mayo Clinic Health System, uh, Franciscan Health and La Crosse on this um, system that um, is on the lower uh, list here, the matching supply and demand. Um, they are uh, going to be putting together a, a time, uh, a date and time for that. So that may be the next one. Um, but again, a number of people have stepped forward and said they would like to present something. And so I am, I'm appreciative of that. And uh, so look forward to those um, presentations in the future. And if you or anyone else that uh, you work with has um, some lessons you'd like to learn or like to share and uh, some topics you'd like to explore, um, you can always um, send me a note that way by email and then also um, participate in some conversations on the, the LinkedIn group. We've had some conversations lately about the uh, current version of the white paper, Pracademic's Guide to Strategy Deployment. Um, 
many of you that um, are on the call today have offered some input into that. And um, so that's going to be um, present, uh, finalized shortly. When I say finalized, the latest version, because we find that we're continuously adjusting these papers as well. So I uh, appreciate everyone's time today. Um, I hope you have a good day, uh, a good weekend. And um, I hope everyone, um, if you're traveling, travel safe. Thanks again for taking the time to participate today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.